morning's reading is taken from Luke 10, verses 25 to 37. Defining neighbor. Just then, a religion scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? He said, that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do it and you will live. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him up, and went off, leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road. But when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. Then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him. When he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. Then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. What do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? The one who treated him kindly, the religion scholar responded. Jesus said, go and do the same. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Uh, Let's stand together and, and just turn to one another and say, It's good to see you here this morning. Give one another a big kiss. (laughs) Maybe not. And then let's uh, continue these conversations later. And find our seats again. Thank you. Let's find our seats again. During, during my teenage years, I, um, I went to lots of rock concerts, and I gradually got deafer and deafer. As the years go on, I noticed that. I f- see there's some brothers and sisters in that category this morning. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's, let's reflect on, the, on this passage together. It's a well-known passage, and we're going to do this over the next two or three weeks because I went into it a little bit when we, we looked at the voice. We th- were thinking about uh, the voice referendum, um, but I want to uh, go a little bit more detail, more, more of a deep dive into what it means uh, to love. And of course, this is a passage that we, we we're familiar with, the story of uh, the Good Samaritan on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, uh, and the the, the, the religion scholar, the lawyer, who, who asked Jesus, what does it mean to love? What does it mean to inherit the kingdom of God? And what does it look, look like to obey the greatest commandment? And, uh, and that's just the donkey out of Shrek. 
So I don't know if you can quite read this, but I'll, I'll read it to you. This is from a, a, a liturgy, uh, um, I, I guess, in a, an Anglican or a uniting church. Uh, and it's, this is uh, the same kind of text that, that's in Mark's gospel. And it goes like this, uh, uh, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. I have these in a Word document if that would be easier. <laughs> Margaret, be warned when you're editing the newsletter. <laughs> And uh, as we know, it's a season of Lent when evangelicals start talking about what they are planning on giving up for Lent. The Pope's just around the corner. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so let's, let's think, think about this. Love, uh, the character traits that we, we develop. Um, one of the strengths of smaller churches can be loving relationships. In fact, research shows that it's a key factor in healthy church life, and one that smaller churches have the potential to do even better than other sizes of churches. So over the, over the next few weeks, we're going to park on the Good Samaritan, a passage about love for others, certainly. But firstly, in the light of these verses, we have to recognize that love for neighbor flows out of love for God. The two are entwined and inseparable, and at times almost identical, but there is a distinction slightly there. So we're going to ask what tips this passage gives us in terms of, of how we love God this week, and then we'll think a bit more about neighbors in the coming weeks. Because Jesus clearly connects love for God with the ability to love neighbors. Seems appropriate for Lent. The purpose of the season of Lent is, is the run-up to Easter. It's a solemn season to remember the love of God that is poured out through Jesus Christ on the cross and His death and resurrection. By that, we are brought into the love of God. His defeat of death, sin, and Satan enables that to happen. So for many churches across the world and for many Christians across the world, um, this season is marked by times of prayer, particular fasts, and extra giving to the poor. But the goal is to become people of love. And it's 40 days leading up to Easter, um, reflecting Jesus' time in the desert before his ministry, a preparation time for loving others in God's way, if you like. Now, let's just think about this for a moment. The goal of all practices, like we've talked about in our small groups, like fasting and prayer, isn't to make us feel more spiritual. And nor is Lent to be a kind of morbid fascination with sin or weeding the garden of our lives. The practices are there to bodily train us to become those who can obey this very command that Jesus talks about in this passage, which is an incredibly high bar to set. Love the Lord your God with all your might, strength, intellect, everything you've got, basically. And the, the different versions of that passage reflect that sense of everything you are. And love your neighbor in the same way. Now, let me just reflect on, on practices for a moment. Um, 300 years ago, um, uh, 300 years ago, there's a guy called Rene Descartes who said, anyone know what he said? Uh, you say it in French, Sue? No? Je, something je pense? Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I think, therefore, I am. I think, therefore, I'm. Now, the entirety of Western civilization has been pivoted around that particular phrase. Our brains, are, we are just brains on sticks, right? That's kind of the worldview of Western culture, and it, it feeds into the education system. So we, we saw everybody in rows from the 19th century onwards, and we're all just got to feed people's brains. It's all about what goes in there. there but during, there was a, uh, during the 19th century, and, uh, but certainly right up to the 1960s and into the postmodern era, as we call it, the Romantic movement in the 19th, uh, 19th century, um, it wasn't just about brains they were thinking about. They were going, oh, well, what about the heart and the emotions? And the feelings, 
How are they part of, of being a human being? To change character, to become like this command expects us to become, will involve heart and emotions. But it will certainly involve the mind and thinking. But there's one more thing that it also involves. What we do with this body of ours. Practices that we embed into our physical frame. You can't think yourself into transformation, into becoming more loving, or zap, get zapped emotionally and somehow be changed. Paul writes in Romans 12, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, which, which really is saying develop the same kind of practice as Jesus. That's the start for becoming more loving in tiny micro habits. And Lent is just one season that reflects that goal. And we've, we've looked, at, as I say, in, in, our, in, in some of our small groups, at, at three or four of them so far, I was saying to Mari in a conversation with Mari the other day, I've actually listed about 35 of these, so we've got a way to go yet. <laughs> um, I, get, I guess we won't get through all that. Now, that's a long introduction to say that the goal of everything that we do in our bodies ought to be orientated towards this command, to love God and to love God our neighbors. So the way we do our work, the way we, the work we choose to do, the way we think, the way we operate in our families, everything that we do in our bodies, in the habits from the moment we get up in the morning to the, the, the evening. Not just in kind of particular spiritual practices, but our, our kind of way of viewing the world and orientation. And now that is a very long introduction to the, the passage um, as we get into it this morning. Let, let me just pray as we get into this. Lord Jesus, you always set the bar very high in that great tradition of the Old Testament, in that great summary of everything that the Old Testament was pointing to, to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. Lord, as we reflect on your word together, we pray that it, what it would look that you would speak to us about what it looks like to think about these things. Be excited by what you're saying about these things, but also think of those little practices that we can nurture to obey this command in the name of Christ. Amen. Never happened to the Apostle Paul, what does this say? There we go, there we go. A cowboy walked into a Texas bar and ordered three bottles of beer and sat in the back of the room, drinking a sip out of each bottle of beer in turn. And when he finished the beers, the three beers, he came back to the bar and ordered three more. The bartender told the cowboy, you know, a bottle of beer goes flat after I open it. It would taste better if you bought one at a time. The cowboy replied, well, you see, I have two brothers. One is in Australia and the other is in Dublin and I'm in Texas. When we all left home, we promised we'd drink this way to remember the days we drank together. So I drink one for each of my brothers and one for myself. The bartender said, oh, that's a nice custom and left it there. He became a regular at the bar. But one day, he ordered only two bottles. All the regulars took notice and fell silent. And when he came back to the bar for the second round, the bartender said, look, I don't want to intrude on your grief, but I wanted to offer my condolences on your loss and the cowboy looked puzzled and then a, a light dawned and he laughed oh no all my brothers are just fine it's just that my wife and I joined the Methodist church and I had to quit drinking it hasn't affected my brothers though <laughs> another two beers please all right we will always find ways to get around the rules right in this passage the man approaches Jesus with a strong sense of right and wrong, of what God does and doesn't expect. He likes closure and a sense of completion to his religious duties. He doesn't like vagueness. He wants it down in writing so that he knows that he's done it. And Jesus bursts his bubble and exposes this flawed approach to serving God. The man thinks he's coming to test Jesus, whether Jesus knows how to serve God, whether he's an orthodox, a good rabbi, He's also looking not for answers, perhaps, but for validation of his own 
way of thinking. And Jesus exposes that with all his religious effort, even with all these practices that he said, we're talking about practices, it's still possible to avoid the one thing God requires, love. Not knowledge of theology or clever plans for church life, not even great acts of service, love. Paul says as much, right? If I give my bodies to the flames but don't have love, what's it worth? And that love has to be learned and is very practical and involves not merely a collection offering but personal involvement as we'll find in the coming weeks. The man discovers that in the end it is him who is facing the sternest question. He's kept the rules, but does he know how to love God, how to serve God? Does he really know? So let me just reflect on two uh, things this morning. Firstly, nurturing appropriate heart attitudes by becoming aware of your motives. Someone once said to me, your sermon like this morning was like water to a drowning man. Backhanded compliment to say the least, right? <laughs> Knock down someone when apparently building them up, right? This man stands up, which is a social courtesy at the time, a sign of respect, and he gives Jesus the title of respect teacher. But, Luke tells us, he does it to test Jesus. We don't exactly know quite what that means. The, 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 the phrase is, is you know, somewhat ambiguous, a bit like the English. You don't, uh, sometimes a test is a good thing. Sometimes it comes from a, a bad motivation. But it seems, that, given the rest of what Luke writes about the opposition to Jesus, that it's likely he perceives it as a negative thing. Becoming aware of our inner motives is part of maturing as a human being and certainly as a Christian. Looks can sometimes be deceptive. This lawyer is sweetness and light on the outside, but inside maybe he's plotting a little bit. He's got a hidden agenda. People ask things wanting to catch you out to achieve their own ends. Some people criticize to make themselves feel better, but of course it rarely works. Some approach looking for personal validation, saying, love me, approve what I do, Jesus. Some people come for counsel or prayer, wanting a leader's words to validate what they want from God. We don't know all the motives of this man or what was going on in his psychology. Some folks look in the mirror and don't always like what they see, and they approach God saying, give me what I want. You know, I don't always want what I want. Romans 1 says, you know, it gave them over to their lusts and to the things that they want. In that scary passage in Romans 1. I don't, sometimes I don't want to want what I want. Some have the view that faith becomes duty to regulations and certain forms of behavior that are more often than not culture driven. And the more we learn about the human psyche, the more we realize how rarely we meet people who are straightforward. Jesus said of Nathaniel, this is someone in whom I, I don't see any guile. The Bible says at our best, at our hearts can be deceitful. Our motives twisted and a little bit fraught with selfishness, sometimes even unseen by us. The Bible calls that sin sometimes. Sometimes that's a, a, a little bit of a fierce word for um, brokenness. We need a savior because even our best outward actions may mask a hidden agenda that we're not aware of. And this whole process of dealing with that brokenness, maybe with that sin, doesn't end at conversion. It just begins. If we're going to serve God, we have to be asking the question, Lord, search my heart. What are my motives? Help me to become self-aware, to know my weaknesses and tendencies, and to be honest with my closest confidence, to ask others to provide checks for you. And that's one we really find hard. And yet it was the foundation of, talk about the Methodists earlier, the Methodist small group system that developed in the 18th century. They would meet each week and they would ask one another a series of questions. There's some variations on this. But in their small groups, they would uh, ask questions like, how have you sinned this week? They would go around the room. So I'm not going to preach anymore. 
you're first, <laughs> right? Pretty, pretty confronting, right? How, and then the next question would be something like, how have you found the grace of God for that? And then the next question would be, what are you facing in the coming week? It would uh, make you want to keep short accounts, wouldn't it, going to home group? Church is one of the few situations in society where we mix as races and ages. And one of the reasons for mixing together across the ages is to encounter those who think differently to us. It's one of the best ways to grow. It's not always comfortable or nice. It's sometimes challenging, but that's what being a disciple is, rubbing off one another to become more finely honed. One of the great opportunities of being forced into a, a different group, not your own, or a different culture, not your own, is to allow what you encounter to become a mirror on your own life. Anyone who's ever traveled overseas in the non-Western world, or it could be the Western world as well, but you know, you go somewhere and just go, Oh, this is different. What's the, the conversations I'm having here are different. And it becomes a mirror to finding out the way things make you tick. I, I remember going to um, Zimbabwe and my, my host, who was uh, a, a black Zimbabwean pastor, uh, he had a very different view of time to me. I arrived and I had three weeks. I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to see a few giraffes. I wanted to go to the Vic Falls. I wanted to uh, ha have a preach here and there and generally uh, have a, a, a nosy around. Well, his time frame was, was like I was going to be there for three years, you know? Very different way of seeing. Same with the Arabs in Jerusalem when I worked in Israel. Um, they had a term in Arabic, and I, I wish I could remember what it was, but it was sort of like they have a circular view of time. You know, time will come again. No, I'm leaving next week. It will not. You know. What is under the surface? I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Goodwill Hunting. Good movie, movie, powerful movie about an abused teenager who turns out to be a mathematical genius. He was sent to therapy, and Robin Williams plays the therapist, the counselor, and the, talks about the abuse this, uh, with this kid. And in one powerful scene, he's. Robin Williams says to him, it's not your fault. And the kid goes, yeah, yeah. No, no, really, it's not your fault. And he says this about five or six times until the penny drops with the kid that all this abuse that he's received as a child is not his fault. And he cracks and cries like a baby because he's found out some truth about himself. It wasn't his fault. Attitude. You know it when you see it, right? The man comes with a hidden attitude. But what is it? Is it sin? Is it his psyche? Is it a mixture of both? Is it his brokenness? Is it a whole bunch of things? Humans are more complex than simply categorizing them or looking at them on the surface. But Luke has some insight here. This man does te stand up to test Jesus. This is one of my favorite lyrics. We carry a sensitive cargo below the waterline, ticking like a time bomb with a primitive design. Behind the finer feelings, the civilized veneer, the heart of a lonely hunter guards a dangerous frontier. The first steps in discipleship include nurturing a soft heart and learning self-awareness. The man in this passage has to in, in a sense, quite gently by Jesus, have what's going on in his life exposed. To discover our own cargo below the waterline requires a growing awareness of our motives and then a softness that is willing to deal with whatever we find, which is why it's good to get some counseling. This is a first step in discipleship, and it's sad to me when I come across Christians who've hardly begun the journey of self-discovery. Got uh, the wedding next week, uh, the Williams. I'm going to say the Williams kids. We'll call them the Williams kids, and that's going to be a, a lovely time. One of the things we do in we wedding uh, uh, preparation as Baptist pastors is, is look at family of origin stuff. What was the family of origin? And of course, they've got a beautiful family of origin, you know. And, uh <laughs> but it's really important because you bring into relationships, into marriage, what what you're taught as a kid. That's one of those things that's a growing into the understanding of yourself and of one another. 
Now somehow waiting for the Holy Spirit to zap us or change us, if we just do one more Bible study, uh, if we just get something more into our heads, it will leak into our lives. That doesn't work. Or if we have, or, or people sometimes think uh, about others, uh, that uh, sees others as not of us. A view that causes them to be unable to really come alongside someone different without imposing even a kind of religious agenda. Some of these things are caused by our own self-worth, by our own self-identity, and by what makes us tick. The fruit of which can be a lack of love. When, when I talk about others, this is kind of what this guy is, is being exposed to in this passage. He's a Jew. It's a story about a Samaritan, hated enemies, or, and they are an illustration of how to live well with God. This would be revolutionary for this man's thinking that Jesus would put the Samaritan as the hero in the story. Those people over there, that kind of person, you're saying they love God? There's another story a bit like it where uh, the disciples catch somebody baptizing in, or, or cussing out demons, I think it is, in Jesus' name. And they say, oh, we stopped them doing it. Goes, Jesus goes, really? Why? Well, they're not of our group. They're not of our tribe. Be careful when you start saying that kind of thing. Love means becoming aware that that is how we are thinking about a, a person. Love or lack of love can be framed by bad thinking. And we fix it by getting down in the brokenness with them like the Good Samaritan does. And that changes us and our attitude. Motives. So motives, what's behind what you do, what you did or are about to do. The man in this story had been religious and faithful to the law. He thought he was doing God a favor with his service, but at heart his attitudes were unchanged and he was picky over religious matters, but failed to see the self-deception within him. So why don't we say this as a prayer together just before we get into the second part, which is gonna be a lot shorter. Psalm 139 verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Are we willing to ask the Lord to search our lives and show what he finds? Are we willing to do whatever he shows us? Are we willing to practically love someone different to us, not come with our agenda for them? Subconsciously, we're, we're braced to pounce. But come alongside not over and empowering i'm gonna fix you you know the cold play song fix you could hear the tumbleweed bouncing across the room there <laughs> thank you tony <laughs> and that's what this passage addresses in so many ways coming alongside that's what the samaritan has to do he has to get down in the dirt and we'll find out what the significance of that is in, in the coming weeks. This is the first part in learning to love with all our heart. It begins with your heart be, becoming something that God can use, be, becoming something that we're aware oh, there are some bits. There are some creaky bits there, some exposed bits, rusty bits, bits that are broken. And the story Jesus tells exposes all of that in the mind. Okay. Secondly, being prepared to change appropriate heart attitudes, just like that kid there. Everybody talks about changing the world, said Tolstoy. Nobody talks about changing themselves. The lawyer has two more motives. Test the orthodoxy of Jesus, verse 25. And then verse 29, look for the praise of others. Have Jesus say what he wanted him to say and be prepared to get a good clap on the back. Are we prepared to change or are we like the rocking horse that makes motion but no progress? What can you honestly point to in your life in th that Christ has changed in the last six months, six years? Or are we like the lawyer just wanting Jesus to say what we want? Just get me across the line into heaven and I'll be happy. No, the life of Jesus begins now, 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 this year, this week, today, in the processes that we embed into our lives bodily. Now, I've said before, I'll say it again. It's just like teaching your kids to pick up a knife and fork. And we all do it instinctively now. 
We call it instinctive, but it's not. It's something we were all taught from a young age uh, to pick up the knife and fork. We went for Chinese the other day and I was picking up chopsticks for the first time, I think, in about 20 years since we were in Korea. I'd totally forgotten how to use them, right? You, you run, out, run out of practice. You go out of practice. Keep the practices, but realize the end goal. Now, sometimes we come to Jesus, we want him just to encourage and bless us, don't ask me to change. But true repentance means making a change. True discipleship means real change in real areas of life and attitude. And we say, well, it's just my character, I can't change. I carry my childhood to the grave. I, I, you know, I can't be changed, I've always been like this. Christ says, no, I'm offering you a new nature, a new way of life. Sometimes Jesus speaks but can't get through, and the Bible calls it occasionally a hardened heart. Surrender. The lawyer, like us, we all come with mixed motives. We ask for purity from God in the Beatitudes. It says, though, that the pu- it's the pure in heart who see God. I don't know the response of the lawyer. We're not left with an answer at the end of the parable. It's deliberately left open. But we do know that Jesus didn't allow him to leave thinking he was safe to go on in his old ways of thinking. He would either leave in turmoil or leave with new resolve, maybe some new things that he was going to do. His ways of thinking about who was in and who was out, who to love and who not to love would be changed. His ways of thinking about what it means to be a holy and a pure people would be changed. And so we, we come again to this verse of scripture in closing Lord expose our hidden motives and grant us the willingness to change and let's say together search me O God let's say it together search me O God and know my heart test me and know my anxious thoughts see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting Lord, would you teach us from your word, show us what it looks like to just develop a micro habit this week, today. Maybe in the way we think about others, to not to catch ourselves when we think negatively or badly about others, or in that little habit of a daily routine, a small thing, a five minute thing, a micro habit that builds up to a lifetime of change. Lord, would you help us to be people who have this com- these commandments ringing in our ears every day of our lives, not as a condemnatory thing, but as a, a gentle prod, a reminder, this is what we are called to, to love the Lord your God with all our power and strength and bodily effort, and likewise our neighbor, that we might be made perfect in Christ. We know that you come in and around our our wills and what we do in our bodies. You come by your spirit and you make those changes that much more than we could ever manufacture, as it were, by some kind of law or rules or whatever. But Lord, would you just show us what it is we're supposed to do in this collaborative sharing of the yoke that we might be the people of God you call us to be this year. And all God's people said...